Yeah, so we have here now a nice criterion for deciding when operator is self-adjoint, but maybe in most cases we have essentially self-adjoint operators and we want to deal with them and it would be good to maybe see or rewrite this uh, in a form which also talks about self essentially self-adjoint operators. And one can do this and maybe it's, it's clear <coughs> what we have, okay, here, if I have here essentially self-adjoint, how I have to weaken the conditions here. Uh, but this is also a nice statement, so maybe let me write it down. I mean, this follows more or less from what we have there, so I'm not going into the proof of this, but just write it down. So now I have an operator, the situation is as before. Uh, so I have an operator uh, which should be symmetric. So we know it's closable. And then, again, I'm claiming that a few things are equivalent. And the first thing now is that we want our operator to be essentially self-adjoint. So T is essentially self-adjoint, which means, of course, the closure of the operator is self-adjoint, and then we can apply this theorem to the closure. But we want now to write things down in terms of the operator itself. And in two, the only thing which we are losing there is that T has to be closed. Uh, that's, of course, exactly the, what makes the difference between essentially self-adjoint and self-adjoint. Uh, so we just have to omit this, and the conditions on the kernels are the same. So the kernel of T star plus I should be trivial, trivial and the kernel of T star minus I should be trivial. Yeah, and in part three, of course, again, we are using what we proved essentially by using the fact that T is closed, uh, namely the fact that this range is closed. And what we get from those conditions is that these ranges are dense. And that's exactly what, what remains here. So this condition three is now just replaced by the fact that T minus I and also the range of T plus I are dense in my Hilbert space. Yeah, and of course, in this formulation, the equi equivalence between two and three is even much easier because then it's really just this uh, relation between the, the range and the kernel of, of, of T and T star. Yeah. Good. So. Maybe I should make a few remarks to the whole thing because it might look, yeah, it might be a bit unclear what all this means. In particular, maybe what is the role of, of having here two conditions, one for, for, for plus and one for minus i, and why, why don't we require more of them, and do we really need two? Huh? But the point is, actually, those two conditions are independent. Huh? So it could, there could be symmetric operators for which one of them is dense, but the other is not dense. Huh? So we really need have to, to check both of them if we want to have this essentially self-adjoint. Yeah. But let me fa make a few more remarks in this context. Uh, so may maybe f first let me yeah, give you a small picture what this uh, situation here uh, really tells us or means. So let's say we have a closed operator. Uh, so let's say we are more in, in this setting. <coughs> so for a closed symmetric operator, T, and then I'm looking on T plus minus I. So let, let me just look on, on T plus lambda. And lambda, let's say, is plus or minus I. We have. The situation, you know, I have a closed operator. So maybe I, I draw a, a picture how, how my operator acts and, 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 and yeah, what, what, what is the, the image. Huh? So, so here's my Hilbert space, let's say. And then, or maybe let's say, I'm lo just looking on the domain of my operator. So this is a dense uh, set. And then I'm looking on the action of the operator T plus lambda. 
Huh? Okay, so this maps into my Hilbert space. And now this Hilbert space decomposes into, uh, yeah, into subspaces accord according to what is the range. Huh? So I'm looking on a range of T plus lambda, and this is in general just a subspace and not, in general, not even dense. Huh? So this is, a, this is a subspace of uh, T plus lambda. And if I assume that my operator is closed, this is actually a closed subspace. Huh? So, so this is here. The that my operator is, is closed tells me that this is a, is a closed subspace. Uh, but if my operator is not self-adjoint, then it will not be everything, but there will be an orthogonal complement. So I can decompose my Hilbert space here into the range plus the orthogonal complement, which is then the, the range of T plus lambda orthogonal complement. And this orthogonal complement of the range, we know that this is the kernel of the T star. Huh? So this is, this is really the, the kernel of the adjoint of this, which is T star uh, plus lambda bar. Yeah, okay, and now, and so my, my operator T here maps the domain here just onto this space, and then a piece is missing, and this I can describe either as the orthogonal complement of the range, or maybe more in terms of my operators itself as the kernel of the T star. Uh, and now you see why I'm, I want statements about those two guys. Uh, so namely the statement that this is everything is the same as the statement that this is trivial. So those, those are the two things there. And this really, if my operator should be self-adjoint, then this must be everything, and this must be trivial. Uh, so then here I have the mapping onto the whole uh, space. Yeah, so maybe let me write this down here, this condition for self-adjointness. So we have, so this is the general situation for a closed symmetric operator, but if I want my operator to be self-adjoint, then this means I have to check that this here is everything, or this is nothing, but I have to check it for two lambdas, namely for plus and minus i. Uh, so this is equivalent to the fact that the dimension, let's say, of the kernel of T star plus lambda bar, uh, so let, let us take this one, that this is equal to zero, but both for lambda plus i and lambda equal to minus i. Yeah, and this might look a little bit uh, special. So why, why do I take plus and minus i? Why don't I take other lambdas? And what is the situation with other lambdas? So if I take instead of i, if I take uh, 3 plus 5i, what, what can I then say about this? Uh, and the point is, it's enough to know it for both of them because uh, the dimension of this guy here is constant in the upper half plane and constant in the lower half plane in, in terms of lambda. Uh, so what we really have, important fact, which I'm not going to prove, uh, which can also yeah, be done, it's not, it's not too complicated, but the fact that if I'm looking at the function lambda goes to the dimension of the kernel of T star minus lambda. So this is constant both on the upper and the lower half plane. Huh? So this is constant on the upper half plane. C plus, and it's constant on the lower and on the lower half plane. C minus. Yeah, okay, but it's not constant everywhere, it, so this means the value on the upper half plane can be different from the value on the lower half plane. So this means I should determine the value in the upper half plane and I should de determine the value in the lower half plane. So let's say I take it for, pl for plus i and for minus i. Uh, and then I don't need the other ones because they are all the same. In the upper half plane, they are all the same as for plus i, and in the lower half plane, all the same for minus i. Yeah, and this is really, I mean, this theorem tells me that this, having those, let's say, 
those two numbers, these dimensions here, is really what I should look at to see whether my operator is self-adjoint. Uh, so namely, if both of them are equal to zero, uh, the dimension for plus i and the dimension for minus i, if both of them are equal to zero, I have a self-adjoint operator. But furthermore, uh, those two numbers even tell me whether I can extend my operator to a self-adjoint one if it is not already a self-adjoint. Uh, and so that's really something which I only want to tell you now, the statement, so I'm not going to prove it. Uh, so this is a nice, nice theory, going back to, to von Neumann, uh, which maybe you, you should uh, look up and, and calculate because it, it, it's very nicely. But uh, yeah, we, I only want to give you the statement so that you have a, a feeling that really those, what, what those numbers really mean and that they are re really very important uh, for talking about extensions of our operators. Uh, so namely, if my operator is not self-adjoint and also not, not, not essentially self-adjoint, so this means I should, usually I will try to look for extensions, uh, which means I have to make the domain bigger uh, so that I might get a self-adjoint operator. And so the question is, what can I say about self-adjoint extensions? So the possible self-adjoint extensions of a symmetric operator T, let's say, uh, are completely determined by those two numbers of the, these dimensions of the kernel of uh, T star plus i and the dimension of the kernel of T star minus i. So those are completely, let's say, characterized by those numbers. And those guys are usually called the defect indices huh, because they are me measuring uh, yeah, the, the, the defect which is missing here to the whole space in the range huh, by its defect. indices, and so let me call them uh, yeah, M and N. Uh, so M is the dimension of the kernel of T star minus I, uh, which is the same as the dimension of the range of T plus I orthogonal complement. So this is the, the index, this is this defect in the, in the upper half plane, let's say, and N is the, in the, is the defect in lower half plane. Huh? So I mean, uh, instead of minus i, I could here put minus 3i or some other number in the upper half plane. But for the lower half plane, I might get another number. So if I take the kernel of t star plus i, which is the same as the dimension of the range of t minus i, orthogonal complement. Huh? OK, so those are two numbers uh, which we should calculate of our operator, and then we understand whether we can extend it in a, in a good way to a self-adjoint operator. And maybe let me just say what we have. So, so, so what we have seen here is that if those two numbers are zero, then we have a, a self-adjoint, or in general an essentially self-adjoint operator. But what happens if they are not zero? Can we then somehow improve? And the point is, if the operator is not self-adjoint, or not essentially self-adjoint, we can extend the domain. And by doing so, we can uh, lower this defect. Huh? So we can, we, can, or we, can, we can make the range here bigger and bigger, or, or this defect here smaller and smaller. But, and so, so may maybe at some point we reach that the defect is zero. But there are constraints because if we uh, make this extension, we, uh, we change the, the two defects in the same way. Uh, so we can make one index, uh, one, we can make one smaller, but by this we're also making the other one smaller. So this means uh, if we want to reach zero, uh, we can do this. But then we are changing both of them in the, in the same way, which means if they are not equal, then I mean we, we cannot reach with both of them a zero. Uh, but if both of them are equal to zero, uh, both of them are equal, then we really can uh, change them 
them simultaneously so that at some point both of them are becoming zero and we have a symmetric operator. So that's uh, really the situation here. So which I want to note here. So in particular, so what do those defect indices tell us? So first of all, they tell us whether our operator is essentially self adjoint. Huh? That's what we want. That's what we first should check. And this is given if the pair m comma n of the two defect indices is just zero comma zero. Uh, so if you have this situation, then then we are in a good situation and, and we are more or less done. We have a good operator, which is essentially self adjoint, and we can keep this operator. But if the defect indices are not zero, then this operator is not self-adjoint, or not essentially self-adjoint, and we should try to improve this by increasing the domain. Huh? Okay, and this can be done. So this T has self-adjoint extensions, if and only if, if both indices are the same. Uh, because if we improve them, we can only change both of them at the same time. So this means if this m comma n is of the form k comma k, it's the same k. Uh, if k is zero, we are already in the self joint case. If it is not zero, then we can really uh, find self joint extensions of our operator. But if k, if, if the two indices are different, so if I have here a situation uh, k comma l, where k is really different from L, then actually this operator T has no self-adjoint extension. Uh, and this means there's no way of changing somehow ex the definition of my operator to make a good operator out of it. Uh, so uh, thi this can also happen. Uh, so there are symmetric operators, which look nice. Uh, maybe they have a nice domain. Everything look ni looks nice. But still, it's not possible to make a self-adjoint operator out of of this one. Uh, so this means this is not an operator about which we can really say a lot. Uh, we, we don't have the strong mathematical properties for them. Uh, so in this case, uh, T has no self joint extensions. Good. Okay, and I think probably it, it's time to look on examples because I mean all this is this is nice, but I mean to really get a feeling what all this means, we should look on concrete examples and see uh, whether they are self joint or not, or if they are not, uh, whether we have self joint extensions and what it really means to to go over to self joint extensions. Huh? And, and of course, we will look on our operators in which we are interested. One, of course, is the multiplication operator which is kind of, of easy, but we will start with this. And then the operator P, our uh, differentiation operator, this is of course much more critical because if I want to differentiate, then the domain of my operator, of course, is a question which is more subtle and, and which I have to, to think more carefully about.